Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Praise God. We're, uh, we're in the book of Ephesians. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And uh, last week we started there and we got to the part where it says that you might walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing. We got off on that, that word worthy um, and uh, kind of got hung up there. And never got past it. So I don't know what to say except praise the Lord. Amen. And uh, that was down in verse 10. And that word comes from the Greek again, axios. And it means to, it's used uh, in, in Greek with a pair of balance scales. And so Paul was writing and saying he wished, he wanted their lives to be balanced. We walk worthy of the Lord or we walk in balance with the spiritual work that's accomplished in us walking it out in the flesh. Amen. We are to govern our bodies and the appetites of our flesh. And everybody said, eat ba 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 <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. So we, we spent, some, spent a good portion of time there last week. So let's go ahead here. And, and, and so, uh, and after we talked about that, we did start a little bit further down. Paul says, he um, gives thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, praise God. Um, this began, this is kind of, a, you know, this, this prayer that Paul was praying. You know, he wants uh, the person to walk worthy. Then he wants, uh, then he starts talking about giving thanks. Verse 13 says, who has delivered us from the power of darkness, translated us unto the kingdom of his dear son. How did, aren't you glad that we've been translated from the exosia? Now, the word, Greek word for power here, the, from the power of darkness, is exosia. Authority. We've been delivered from the authority of darkness. Amen. Somebody can, you know, somebody can break in your house and, and bind you, but they don't have the legal or the authority to do so. Uh, they can't keep you bound if you have enough strength to break free. No, now, they put you in prison. They have the authority to bind you. Then, you know, that you're, you're forced in submission to that. But you just can't walk in somebody's house and, and incarcerate them. <coughs> and... If there's an enforcer on the scene, they can keep you, them from, from doing that. Amen? And we have an enforcer. Amen? Who's delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, uh, the gospel is about being delivered from the authority of darkness. Now, not just that. You know, I've hear, you hear people say, well, I'm free. I can do whatever. I want. And, and, and what they're making the statement is they're, they're only taking this one part of I'm delivered from the authority of darkness. I'm free. But the truth of the matter is it, that's only half the equation of what's actually took place. You were delivered from the authority of darkness and then translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Why? Jesus rules in that kingdom. You're delivered from the authority of darkness, but you're translated into another kingdom where there is the king of kings and lord of lords. Amen. And as Sister Wilkerson used to say, in the potentate of potentate of potentates, you know, her, um, whatever her name is, thing hangs out with Gloria. Billy Bram sounding voice. Actually, Billy Bram has a Gene Wilkerson sounding voice. Hallelujah. And, uh, and, and honestly, if you ever listen to a, a tape of Sister Wilkerson and hear her kind of get over into the spirit, you go, oh, that's where Billy Bram used to hang out. All right. Okay. So it says here, we are delivering. Um, Paul wrote about God delivering us. Think, say, say, God delivered me. What did he deliver you from? Say, he delivered me from the authority of darkness. But that wasn't all. He translated me into the kingdom of his dear son. Say, he translated me into the kingdom of his dear son. So you understand that your deliverance from the kingdom of darkness, from the authority of darkness, was half of the work of Christ, in other words, in your life. But they, that, that it didn't stop there. Then you were translated into the kingdom of his domain. Remember, the word kingdom comes from, the, from, from combining the words king, or uh, the kings, and then dumb, dumb, domain, the king's domain, kingdom, okay? 
And so we were translating this place where Jesus is the king of that domain. So what? We are still under authority. It's just not the authority of darkness. We're under the authority of the king of kings and lord of lords, the head of the church, glory to God. We now operate and function under a, a, a higher and greater authority. It's the kingdom of light. Somebody say glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. So we have a contrast here. Jesus came and delivered us, but we just can't say, I'm free to do whatever. No, 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 no. You were delivered from Satan's authority or the kingdom of darkness authority, the exosia, the power of darkness, the exosia, the authority of darkness. And then you came into another kingdom. So I came into another kingdom. Okay. In whom we have redemption. You know, remember the kingdom of his dear son. Through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So this is the, um, uh, really the ending of this prayer that Paul's been praying. And he says, it's in Jesus we have our redemption. Now he said this Sunday, preaching on the blood of Jesus, we're not bought with, with uh, silver or gold. Hallelujah. We're bought with the precious blood of Christ. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. So there's a price that's been paid for our freedom and deliverance from Satan's authority. And now we are bound to another kingdom. Amen. By choice. Now, you could have stayed in the other one. Stupid if you do, but you can stay in the other one. Dumber than dirt if you do. But you can stay in the other one if you want to. You don't have to leave. Hallelujah. And um, in the Greek, this, the word redemption has a definite article in front of it. It means it's the redemption. And then we have the redemption. See, there's not, there's not multiple redemptions. There's not different ways to find God. There's not... Um, <clears throat> you know, well, you get through Buddha, or you get through Krishna, or you get through uh, the Reverend Moon, or you get through, you know, Islam. <clears> that <throat> this is the redemption. And in the Greek, that's how it's read. In whom we have the redemption, not a redemption or a redemption. In other words, you kind of just took left the, the definite article out, and which they did in the King James. They, they didn't really put it in there, but it's in the Greek. Um, you could you could come back and say, well, you know, that's one of the ways. You know, you got a lot of people who, who say there's many ways to God. Jesus is just one of those. And of course, by 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 virtue of his own statement, that has to be a lie for believers, for Christians, because Jesus says, "I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me." Now, so he can't be one of many. You just can't go, well, we're just going to toss him in there with, you know, with uh, the Reverend Moon. We're going to toss him in there with Muhammad. We're going to toss him in there with the Buddha. We're going to toss him in there with all the different religions of Hindu. You know, the two million or whatever, or, or, or how many ever they have. Uh, gods. They just, you know. And, uh, of course, then if you're Unitarian, Universalist, whatever you think is God, it's God. Dirt. Dirt is God. I worship dirt. You know, you're at 13, you decide what you're going to worship as God. That's your God. Everybody say, the redemption. And do I, in whom? Who's that? We're well, back to the previous verse. It says in the previous verse, it says we, we translate into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption. His dear son is whom we have the redemption. Amen? And how? Through his blood. I said through his blood, glory to God. Hallelujah. You know, we, the word redeem, redemption, redeem means to buy back. He bought us back from Satan's authority. Praise God. Um, hallelujah. And he says this, I like that last, even the forgiveness of sins. Thank God we've been forgiven. Say, everybody say, I'm, we've been forgiven. Oh, uh, so say, 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 say it again like you really mean it. Thank God I'm forgiven. Thank God. Now, I want to, can I say something? I was, we listen to, a, um, Janie has Mark Hankins' radio app on his, her phone. And so she listens to it. And, uh, you know, like she'll lay in bed and listen to it. And, 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 and I get aggravated when, when, because they back up every time with each, each message. You know, each next day on the radio, they back up like three or four minutes. You got to listen to it. You got to listen to Cindy. I love hearing Cindy Black, but I don't like listening to Cindy Black sing over and over again. You know, I'm trying to listen to a message, you know. If you do it on Monday at the beginning and do it on Friday at the end, it'd be wonderful. You know, that's, that's just a personal thing. That, and that's, and I love Cindy's voice. I love to hear her sing, and I love the songs she sings, but I hate it when we chop them up and you got to listen to five minute overlays each day and it takes you, you know, three months to get through one message. Just saying. But in the, in the middle of all that aggravation, there's some good, good stuff. Hallelujah. And he's been preaching on the past couple weeks on thankfulness. 
And he said this. He said, unthankfulness is the root of rebellion. Think about kids when they get unthankful about what their parents have done for them. They get to a certain age and they start getting unthankful. And what do they start doing when they get unthankful? They start rebelling. Think about it. They lack gratitude. Well, you know, uh, they come, well, so-and-so's got a brand new dress and you won't buy me more. You won't let me go do such and such. They're not grateful you're providing all the things you provided for them and all the places you've taken them and all the things you've done for them. They're, uh, they're, they're unthankful because they want something else that you're not either going to allow them to have or not giving them. And they develop an ungrateful heart about it and it sows the seed of rebellion. That went ever big. Still a good word. Hallelujah. So, I think a lot of Christians get to the point they're no longer thankful they've been forgiven. You would not want to go and live in sin if you were grateful that you've been delivered from it. If you were thankful that you were delivered from sin, you would not try to find ways to live in sin. And see, I know a lot of people say, well, we got to tell people that they're okay, God loves them, you know, and we got to make it so that they don't feel bad about the fact they sin. No, 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 you gotta, you've got to know you feel, you've got to feel bad about sinning until you repent. But once you repent, you need to become grateful you've been forgiven. Then you have a grateful heart. You need to have a grateful heart, God redeems you. Paul said to the church at Ephesus, even while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, he, he, he forgave us. Amen. Amen? Well, actually, King James, he says it this way. He says, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he quickened us, made us alive together. Okay? Um, that first four verses of chapter 2. A grateful heart. Now, I'm just going to step on somebody's toes. Right here now. Either in here or on the television. There are a lot of people who left this church because they got ungrateful about what they got. And got huffy puffy about this or huffy puffy about that. And they lost their thankfulness. I am telling you, I'm, I, and I went to the campus a lot of times, uh, Sandy invites people who've never heard basic things like confessing the word. And they're sitting there nearly drooling on the floor. Thank God we got tile over there. They're drooling on the floor because they've never heard it before. And there's like... And they're just kind of sitting there like deer in headlights. Then you come to, you know, you get some people in, in the church five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve, fifty, twenty 20 years. Well, I've heard that a thousand times before. Yeah, but are you working it all thousand times? You know? And begin to get an ungrateful heart and a rebellious spirit gets on them. And then they'll start spreading that in the church. And people get disgruntled because, you know, a well, pastor Ed just keeps talking about faith and keeps talking about healing and keeps talking about confession and talks about not living in sin. Yeah. And they start getting disgruntled, which is what? Rebellion. And all because they developed an ungrateful spirit. When those same people, when they walked through the doors, were like those other people drooling all over the place because this is what they need in life. Oh, this, I, we got to be here because this is the word we need. Oh, I grew up on this and I backslid, but I've come back to God and I've got to have this. We can't develop ungrateful spirits. Now, as adults, don't pass it on to your kids. Amen. Don't let your kids get away with it at home. It's the seed of rebellion. So, now back to this verse. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. We have to remain grateful. God has redeemed us. We have to remain grateful. God has, has forgiven us. We must maintain a great... Now, you don't have to go back and recant. Oh, God, thank you for forgiving me for shooting somebody 25 years. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about fact, Father, you know, I was lost without God, but you redeemed me, and I'm grateful. I'm grateful that you forgave me and washed me clean with the blood of Jesus. And, brought, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live a life of thanksgiving and gratefulness because of that. Hello? You know, you've seen kids, you know, they get, they get uh, ungrateful to their parents. And they're going to go out and <coughs> break their parents' heart and do whatever they want to do. And they just, and they just spend all their inheritance. Uh, <laughs> prodigal son. Um, you know, spend all, you know, uh, wreck cars and just live like the devil. Because they're ungrateful. So they're ungrateful. All right, so we're gonna, what are we going to do? We're going to maintain an attitude of gratefulness. 
We're going to have a heart of thanksgiving. We're going to thank God we've got a place to come that won't compromise the word of God. We're going to thank God we've got a place. You know, <clears throat> that maybe churches are bigger. Who gives a rip? I'm telling you, I'm not, you know, I, I, I won't compromise to get bigger. I've said that before. You know? Well, Pastor, you know, if you just kind of back off a little bit on that drinking thing, you get more people over here. You know? I mean, just put it on the website that we drink wine when our dinner. And uh, we'll get some more folk over here. Pastor, go ahead and tell everybody that you'll accept homosexuals into the church. Oh, Pastor, it doesn't matter if they're tatted up with gauges all over the place. You know, it doesn't matter if they smoke dope. It doesn't matter if they do this. It doesn't matter. Just go ahead. We can get more people and see. No, 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 no. I know the power of walking in the realm of God's dear son where I've been forgiven. I'm not looking to live in the past. I'm looking to live in what God designed me to live in. And I'm called to preach that to other people so they can walk in the place God designed them to live. I have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. And I'm going to teach you that you've got, to, you've got to live in a grateful, thankful heart because of it. And live the way God wants you to live. Why? Because the way God wants you to live is to live out of your spirit. And if you're, listen, this letter, and as we finish up this, we're getting ready to transition into Paul's purpose of this letter. This letter was written to deal with and address Gnosticism. The Gnostics had gotten into the church at Colossae in that region. And one of, the, one of the th the, their major teaching in Gnosticism was Jesus didn't ever come in the flesh. Okay? And there were spirit beings called a Aeons, A-E-O-N-S, that existed between heaven and earth. And they were the intermediators between God and man. <clears throat> Next, that man was spiritual only and his flesh really didn't matter. And so you could, you know, what you did with your body didn't matter because you were just, we're just progressed spiritually. I say this, you can't progress spiritually and it not affect how you walk in the flesh. And you cannot walk in the flesh and not affect you spiritually. It goes both ways. Whoever you give heed to will affect your life. Okay? Man is created a triune being. And so you can't, you can't live in catering to the flesh and expect to be, you know, some spiritual walking on the water giant. Oh, it doesn't matter, God. For, no, 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 no. It does matter. Remember we, took, we quoted you the scripture last week? Glorify God in your spirit and body, which are his. Which are his. Ephesians calls your body the purchased possession. You got, you got a promissory note of a glorified body. He owns your body. Paul said to live, offer your body a living sacrifice to God, which is your spiritual service. Now, if you're offering it as a sacrifice, what does that mean? You're not letting it do what it wants to do. Dick, can you bobble head for me? <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> my neck, I might get a kick in my neck. Hallelujah. So, so he says here, that we have redemption through him, through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. What? Next verse goes on and begins to make, here's Paul beginning to address the Gnosticism, who is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn of every creature. Now, in this particular passage, uh, two things here. Number one, he declares Jesus is the image of the invisible God. In flesh, he is the image of the invisible God. Okay? Hebrews, Paul wrote over in Hebrews, he said he's the, he is the expressed image of his person. Over in Hebrews chapter 1. Okay. Then he says he's the firstborn of every creature. Really this phraseology out of, out of the Greek means more like he's not part of creation. He has the preeminence of creation. He's the head of creation. Okay. So the phraseology here, although it's, you know, it sounds like he's the firstborn of creation, of every creature. It really means, uh, coming out of the Greek language and the construct of that, gives more the meaning of he, is the, he has the preeminence of he is, the, uh, he is where creation came from. Okay? Hallelujah. Praise God. Can you have somebody say amen? He has, he has his priority. He has priority and sovereignty over creation. All right. <clears throat> for by, uh, for, so is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him, everybody say by him, were all things created. 
that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Now think about that now. Paul is dealing with the Gnostic teaching that Jesus didn't come in the flesh. He's really not divine. Yet Paul comes right here and says, of Jesus, all things were created by him. And you go to Genesis, it says, in the beginning, God created. So this is a ex direct de declaration of the deity of Jesus Christ as God. Okay? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. Listen to this. Visible and invisible. Material and non-material. Spiritual and otherwise. You know, because the Gnostics didn't believe the material was really real. Okay? That's why they say it didn't matter what you did with your body because it wasn't really real. It didn't matter. Because all, the spiritual was the real, the real world. This was just some almost, almost like Christian scientists. You know, this is a figment of your imagination. You're not really sick. Um, it's like the guy said, you know, you had a um, prosperity preacher. Amen. A uh, Christian scientist. And I forgot who the other, uh, oh, and a, and, a, and a good Southern Baptist all went to hell. And uh, about, about a week later, you know, the, uh, the devil called heaven and said, got to get these guys out of here. He said, why? He said, well, the Baptists are getting everybody saved. Prosperity preachers raise enough money to put air conditioning in. And that, and that Christian scientist, he don't even believe he's here. <laughs> Hallelujah. <coughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Paul says here, for by him, deity, were all things created. He is the creator, therefore he's God. That are in heaven and in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by and by him and for him. Glory be to God. Amen. Um, something interesting here, the words were created in the first part of this passage. Uh, is in the A.R.T. Uh, tense, and the, and the uh, second one is in the, uh, is in the uh, perfect tense, and it means this. It was an act of creation, and then when it says we're created in the A.R.T. tense, um, the, the next tense, I'm sorry, not A.R.T., in the um, perfect tense, I means it's continuing. He created, and it continued. So it wasn't like a boom, it's oh, this never had anything. His, his work, remember, the universe is expanding in every direction at the speed of light. Because it's in a continuance. And it's for him um, and by him. By him. He did it, and he did it for his pleasure. Creation was the creation of God for his pleasure. That man would fellowship with him out of his will. Because he wanted to. One of the best books you'll ever read along this line is E.W. Kenyon's The Father and His Family. You get, he, he unveils the heart of the father in that book, The Father and His Family, E.W. Kenyon. It's still in print. You can still get it from um, Kenyon's gospel. I forgot what it was. Kenyon Publishing House, whatever it is. What did he say? I could. Kenyon's Bible Publishing. You can still get it from there. Um, excellent stuff. I mean, I think Harrison House actually started carrying Kenyon's stuff a few years ago. So here we have, we're redeemed by his blood. By the, through the forgiveness of his sins. He is the image of the Father. He the, the, has the preeminence of creation. And by him, all things were created. See, the Gnostics taught that material was evil. No, that's why I said it didn't matter. It was, it was created out of evil, therefore God couldn't have anything to do with it. But God, the Word says, he created it. Therefore, he didn't create evil. He didn't create material as evil. The only spiritual man. Now, God desired and desired a, a material world that represented or emulated heaven. And we lived that way. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Think about what, you know, that one guy said, what would, have, what, would have, what would have happened if God hadn't created a woman? We'd still be in the garden. You know, no, 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 no. Adam would have figured out a way to mess it up. Those, those jokes work real good, you know, in a men's seminar. They don't work, in the, they don't, they don't work when you do the women's meetings. Y'all here, y'all going home. And then this next verse reiterates this, you know, uh, he's the firstborn of creation. Remember we said that that meant he had the preeminence or the priority of creation. The next verse says, and he is before all things. And by him all things consist. Reinforcing that interpretation of his... Um, 
<clears throat> that Christ's relationship to creation is not that he is part of creation. He is the creator. He is the head of creation. Okay? Hallelujah. Praise God forevermore. Amen. And then um, Paul summarized his, the, the supremacy of Jesus by saying that um, he is before all things and on by him all things consist. I think as we take the word of God and stop trying to cherry pick <coughs> passages to create and support a mantra, and we take the whole counsel of the word of God, we begin to get a different picture. Jesus came, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, how that he came not to condemn us. Remember, this, he came not into the world to condemn the world, but that, that through him the world might be saved. And we, you know, the word condemn and the word damn in the Greek are the same word. So really he came not into the world to damn the world. What do you mean by that? He came out in the world to <clears throat> seal us in that state of damnation. He came and by his blood to purchase us out of that state. Had he come into the world and said, okay, God is just. Here I am. I'm walking in the flesh. I did everything the law demands. You can't do it. You're going to hell. That would have been he came into the world to damn the world. But he came in the world that the world through him might live, might have everlasting life, might have everlasting life. And so the picture we begin to get, the grace of God is you were lost without God, without hope in this world, alienated from the covenants of God. You're toast, baby. But God looked at his creation even before the foundation of the world, as John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And he said, who will go? Because only one, no man could redeem man that came out of the line of Adam. There's not a man who could come out of the line of Adam who could redeem man. We had to have someone who came in and had the flesh of the world, but their spirit was outside that, and that is the word was made flesh and tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father. God's grace sent Jesus in the fullness of time to go, to live, to accomplish, to fulfill, to take the price, become sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, <clears throat> to go to the cross to take the handwriting of ordinances that were against us and then contrary to us and take it out of the way and nailed it to his cross. And he went and made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And he went and sat down, as we said, Sunday, and took his blood to the mercy seat, put it on the mercy seat, and sat down at the right hand of the Father, where he ever lives to make intercession for us. Now, I just don't think Jesus is up there praying, Father, let him just keep on living in sin. You know, I paid the price, and I showed him how to do it, but <coughs> it really don't matter. We're just going to try to get him into heaven. He came to make a way where man could live the way God created man to live. That is in fellowship with the Father. You can't walk in sin and walk in fellowship with the Father. You might make it into heaven. I'm not going to say you will, but you might make it into heaven. But you won't be fellowshipping with the Father in the process. Like that's where I tell you about the person who's going to sell cigarettes in a, in a vending machine. And they, I said, well, pray. Just say, Lord, I, I sell these to your glory. And they came back a week later and said, I can't do it. They couldn't sell them because they knew they couldn't walk in fellowship with the Father and do it. Just their conscience wouldn't let them. Okay? Now, he goes on verse 18. And just as he is supreme over natural creation, he's sovereign over the new creation, the church. Next verse. And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And in all things, he might have preeminence. Not just preeminence in creation, preeminence in the church. Jesus is the head of the church. Jesus is the head of creation. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Order was disrupted when Adam committed high treason. Jesus came back to restore order. Put things back in what? Axios. Back in balance. So that man could live in harmony with God the way he was created. Now remember up until the fall when Adam fell in the, in the Garden of Eden and committed high treason, God would come down the cool of the day and they'd walk together in fellowship. I mean, you know, kind of get that song. And he walks with me and he talks with me. And he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there. None other will ever. Whatever, I forget how it goes at the point. But I walk through the garden alone. God would come down and fellowship with man in the cool of the day. And that was broken 
at the fall of Adam. God did not send Jesus so you can keep walking outside the garden. He sent Jesus to bring you into the garden. Amen. So you could fellowship with him. Have communion with him. Glory to God. And so, you know, I understand baby Christians fighting for things because they're just babies. I don't understand preachers helping them. Amen. I don't, I don't, I don't understand more, supposedly more mature Christians helping them, looking for excuses to help people stay outside the garden when God's called us to come back to the garden so he can come down and fellowship with us and he can commune with us. And the one that has preeminence of creation and the one who has preeminence over the new creation, glory to God, shed his blood to buy us back so we could do that. Hallelujah. How great is the grace of our God? And I'm not talking about you sin and get away with it. I'm talking about how great it is that he sent Jesus to get you out of the mess you were in and take someone who was lost without God, without hope, without covenant with God, and bring them in through the new birth into a new kingdom, into a new creation, into a new body. And establish you in a way that now you can come into the presence of the, the holy almighty creator of all that we know and see and even things we haven't seen and stand before him justified declared righteous just as if I'd never sinned and stand there having been lost having been sinned now decreed and declared righteous by the redemptive work of Christ the head of this new creation I come stand before the father Oh, the grace of God. I'm not cast from his presence as profane because I've been washed. Whew. Glory to God. And my thankful heart does not go, oh, well, praise God. Now I can go out and fornicate all I want to because grace lets me. No, 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 no. That grace that you're taking advantage of, the Bible Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. There are those who've crept in, Jude says, and turned the grace of God into lasciviousness or lasciviousness. That's not a good word, by the way. It should drive us to come with praise. Paul said, now thanks be unto God, who always causes us to triumph through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul got one place, he got so excited over there in Romans, said, I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor power, nor, uh, nor principality, nor things present, nor things to come, nor any other thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. That's, that's what we're talking about, preacher. You can do whatever. No, 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 no. Go read all the other stuff Paul said. He said that at the end of chapter 8 after he talked about keeping your body and offering your body and not letting your body just do what it wanted to do. You know, keep your members in service of righteousness. Oh, how wonderful is God's grace. Ed Taylor does not have to try to live right because of his ability. I now have one on the inside of me who's greater. Pope John said and declared, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And I'm able to declare that when I face something that my, my ability to overcome and my ability to say no to, I can look to the greater one on the inside. And that's where grace takes over. Paul did not say, I'll rejoice in my infirmities and continue to live in defeat. No, he said, I'll rejoice in my infirmities for when I am weak, then am I strong. I actually said this, that, because God said, my grace is sufficient. What does that mean? He said, at my weakest point, when I look to him, his grace empowers me over. It makes me go over the top. It doesn't keep me there. It lifts me up. When I'm in the third time being shipwrecked, you know, or, or, th or th third time being, or receiving 39 strikes, uh, less one. 40 strikes, save one. And it looks like I want to quit and want to give up. And that weakest moment, that weakest hour, the grace of God takes me and takes me up another level. You know, when I can't, when I don't have the strength to do anything else, when I reach my weakest point, when I, when I cannot deal with this and it's more than I can handle. God's grace does not come and say it's okay to, the, to go ahead and quit and give up. It is the empowerment to rise up and win and overcome. Oh, how beautiful is God's grace. And shame on those who've hijacked it 
and used it to build ministries and to sell books and to sell teaching series, you know, and telling people it's okay to keep living like you're living when all along God's grace was sent to deliver them from that. His grace was sent to break that power off of their life, not damn them to it. <coughs> that went over th enthusiastically. People out there on the internet are going, well, yeah, glory to God. Preach on, Pastor Ed. The thousand or so that are listening. Isn't that about right, Brother Bill? He's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Hallelujah. That in all things he might pray have preeminence, both in the natural and in the supernatural. Amen. He is the source, Arche, Archie, Archie. Uh, he is the source, the origin. He's the firstborn. That is the first to rise from the realm of the dead. What death? Not physical death. We know people were raised from physical death all throughout the Old Testament. Old Testament. Under the ministry of Jesus, people were raised from the physical death. He's the first one to come back from the region where he went to pay the price for our sin. He's the firstborn. Okay? For it pleased the Father that in him shall all fullness dwell. This is interesting because the word fullness, pleroma, um, <coughs> would, rise, would reside in Christ is a word used by the Gnostics for the totality of the so-called divine emanations or the intermarried beings we talked about earlier. They called that the fullness. And God said in Jesus all the fullness dwelled. He used the exact same word they used. He said you're saying this but Jesus all the it pleased the Father for all the fullness to dwell in Jesus. Hallelujah. So when they heard that word, when Paul, Paul wrote this letter, and they're reading that in the congregation, and they heard that word, Paul's challenging everything the Gnostics had brought into there. They're telling you there are intermarried beings out there called the fullness, but in the Jesus all the fullness dwells. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It pleased the Father for it to dwell in Jesus. Next verse, it says, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Amen? Uh, the reconcile means to be brought back in the proper relationship. God was not the offender. Folks, mankind was the offender. Therefore, God never changes. Mankind has to change. To be brought back, when, when listen, how many know you, you establish uh, in, in studies and surveys, whatever, you establish a baseline? Well, it was, the baseline never changes. And when things get off the baseline, you have to reconcile it. You have to bring what's out of line back into line. Or let's use Star Trek. When, you know, the, the, the uh, warp coil gets out of alignment, you got to get back in alignment so you can have warp speed. So, you know, in the first movie, Spock dies. The second one, Kirk dies. A little play on that. You know, come on. Anyway, Brother Bill, <laughs> hallelujah. And it says here, so he, he came to reconcile things, bring them back into proper relation. And so this term is used in, in reconciliation. It's not used of, you know, God giving a little bit, man giving a little, and, you know, and, you know, and they kind of work. No, God stayed. And through, and let me say something, folks. Can you see more and more what I'm talking about, what I've been saying for some, some time now about grace and the misuse of it, you know, as, as we're talking about these things right here? Jesus came not so you could stay out of line with God. He came to reconcile us, bring them back into harmony with God. Axios balanced, reconcile. Man's out of reconciliation. He's out. Um, I watch Nathan too, and I know Dick obviously knows this, but I watch Nathan tune his guitar all the time. He's got a little app on his phone, you know, and he'll, he'll hit that tune, and it'll be going in, and, and the little, little thing, meter will be going all over here, and he'll be up here on the little thing going in, and all of a sudden they go, jing! Now that meter, true is true with that meter all the time. And when you get that string just right, it lines right up. And see, we're out of tune. Jesus came to tune us. Or to reconcile us, bring us back into tune, bring us back into harmony with God. Now, how many have ever driven a car that was out of alignment? And they could take it in. And let me say this. You can have one left front tire out of alignment, and that car drives like a three-legged dog. 
And they put that up on the thing, you know, and they go, well, the right tire is, not, is perfect, the back tire, the back tire is perfect. Now, this left front, it's towed in and twisted, you know, and, you know, and that's why you're going, blah, 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 blah. They sit there and they turn things back around duh, 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 and put it back up there and you know, do all the stuff. There. And all of a sudden, when you drive out of there, they're back in harmony. And you think, my God, it drives like a new car. I'm not, get, I'm not getting, you know, the, the, free, you know, the free massage while I'm riding down the road. You know, your arms are shaking from being so bad. You know, anybody driven a car that was that bad out of alignment? Oh, God. It's terrible. Jesus, hallelujah, all the fullness dwells in him, and having made peace, the word, uh, yeah, uh, peace by the blood of his cross, glory to God, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, whether things in earth or things in heaven. He came to reconcile the, remember Adam's sin touched and tainted all the creation but the throne of God. And Jesus came to reconcile and to put it all back in harmony. What does that mean to us as believers? Think about it now. You hear people say stupid stuff like, it doesn't matter whether you can continue to live in sin, you can be a gay, you can come into the church. And, and well, the Bible speaks against all these things. Well, it doesn't matter because, you know, God loves us. Yes, he loves us. That's why Jesus came. Why? Because we were out of harmony with him. Sin puts you out of harmony with God. Jesus came to reconcile. God doesn't change. God is still that same baseline. He, he, does, he is the Lord. He changes not. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's just going to be. That's the way it is. The baseline is the baseline is the baseline. Never change. What did Jesus come to do? Man's out of harmony with that. Sin takes him out of harmony with God. He came to reconcile us, to bring us into harmony. So what does that mean to us? That means we now, as the scripture said, we read earlier, left last week, be holy as, even as he is holy. God is holy. The baseline's holy. It doesn't change. Say it doesn't change. God doesn't stop being holy just because some bozo wrote another Bible. It doesn't change just because somebody gets up and says, I was walking around the house the other day and God told me, but you can't find it in the Bible. You know, I get tired of people's preachers preaching what God told them and they don't back it up with Scripture. Or it's so isolated and so obscure that you've you got you to have a, um, uh, the help of stupidity to try to make it fit that, what God told them. No. Jesus has come, and he's, he's here to reconcile. He is to bring back in the proper relationship man with God. Man with God. Proper relationship. What does that mean? God was not the offender of man, between God and man. Man was. That means man stepped out of harmony with God. Jesus came to put us back in the harmony with God. What? Just like before Adam fell, we walk in harmony obedience to the Father. We walk in the Father's will. We walk as the Father walk. We live unto pleasing Him. Our life is a representation of having a relationship with Him. The grace of God empowers us where we are weak to do that even when we, we can't do it in our ability. Now we walk in our heart. Jesus has come to bring us back to that place. Amen? So stop listening to people telling you that if you're out of that place, it doesn't matter. Well, you still get to go to heaven. Even if you got to go to heaven, you've lived out of harmony with God. And if you love God, you want to walk in harmony with him. You want to walk in fellowship with him. Are y'all here or are you going home? I didn't hear real. Okay. <coughs> uh, reconciliation, with the, the, this commentary here, has both an objective and a subjective side. The objective side, God removed the barrier between himself and man. How? By the blood of the cross. He removed the barrier. See, until Jesus' blood was shed, there was a barrier after the fall of man. So the objective side is God went, boop, the barrier is removed. That don't make it so in your life. Just because the barrier is removed don't mean anything if you don't walk through it where the barrier was. The subjective side of this is um, people must accept the possibility of this reconciliation that God provided. In other words, we've talked about this before, how that when people die without Christ, their name is blotted out of the Lamb's book of life. See, God's already made the reconciliation available. 
you have to accept it. You have to walk in it. And if you don't, it doesn't do you any good. Amen. Like we, uh, I think I shared this. Maybe I shared this in Winston-Salem recently. You know, Dick Panthers play next week at, at uh, uh, Bank of America Stadium. You, you and take Ellie, and y'all drive down there um, and go to the Will Call ticket window, and there's two tickets in your name for box office seats. I bought them for you. Dick goes, man, Pastor Ed bought me two tickets to the game. Box seats. All I got to do is go down to the Will Call and pick them up. That day gets here. It's a, it's a Saturday because it's preseason. You know, and here on a Saturday, Dick's sitting at home. It's about 6.30. Turns the TV on. The game's coming on. He goes, you know, hey, Ellie, we got tickets down in the box office. And those seats are sitting empty at the stadium. Why? Because they're reserved for Dick and Ellie. Those tickets were bought. But they didn't go take and pick them up and receive them and act on it. And because they didn't act on it, they failed to experience what was set aside for them. It was purchased. It was bought. It's there. And if somebody comes and sits in that seat, they'll make them get up and move. Let me see your tickets. Well, I don't have to. Where's your ticket? You, you got to go over there. These are for somebody else. They're already bought. Jesus has paid the price. He's made it so all men can be reconciled. So, on that, so when you see scriptures that talk about, you know, he hath forgiven us and all that, yeah, he's made the provision. It's bought. You've got to pick it up. You've got to walk in it. If they don't drive down to Charlotte and they don't pick up those tickets and they don't go sit in those seats, they don't get the benefit of it. Can you say hallelujah? And you, who were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Now, <clears throat> Paul reminds him in a very straightforward manner. You were, you were outside the things of God before. Yet now hath he reconciled. Amen? This, uh, the, 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 Paul even writes here, the, the, uh, the, um, he pinpoints the Colossians' form of behavior because many Gnostics taught that it mattered little how a person lived in the body as long as he cultivated the spirit. That approach serves a very convenient justification for practicing sin. Paul connected the word mind and wicked works, yet now in this verse indicates God's intervention. Yet now you have, you've been reconciled. He hath, now hath he reconciled. Yet now hath he reconciled. You did serve him in evil works and in vanity of your mind. Now you're reconciled. Um, the, the contrast between you were sometimes alienated enemies, now you're reconciled. Gnostics did, See, we, we get forms of that same devil out there, that Gnostic devil running around. Maybe that'd be full blown, it could be forms of it. Oh, it don't matter what you do. Yes, it does. You were alienated and enemies of God. Now he reconciled you. Amen? I, mean, I don't think I'm trying to get done, but it's, it's going to take me another 30 minutes. We'll cover this verse. In the body of his flesh through death, that is, the, the Greek word body, soma, and the flesh, sarx. Okay? So Jesus did have an actual body. So the Gnostics said he didn't have an actual body, but he did. Okay? Um, flesh, a lot of times, refer, refers to not the, the physical, but the, the sphere in which we operate. We operate in the fleshly sphere, and if we don't control that flesh, we'll, we'll live under the domain of, the, of a fallen world. Okay? So he, he, Jesus came in the body, the soma, he had a physical body. Okay, How, and what did he do? In the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. He came to live out in his body in the realm of the flesh a holy life. Anybody know what's going to be on the vesture of Jesus when he shows up on his horse? Anybody remember what's on there? On his vesture? Holiness to the Lord. He's not coming with grace. He's not coming with love, not coming with righteousness. He's coming with holiness to the Lord as his vesture. I think it's important if the one thing vesture he could pick up was not Miss North Carolina or Miss California, you know, it was holiness to the Lord. All we need is love. It's just a love thing. <laughs> really? Don't you get it? Man's being out of harmony with holiness is 
Love, because of man's disharmony with holiness, sent Jesus to reconcile us back to it. That's the love of God. See, we teach so often that the love of God is the condoning of what God hates. And we shared this other week, how that Jesus loved righteousness and hated iniquity. And so, y'all enjoying this at all? Okay. And so now we have him coming, <clears throat> and he has come to present us unholy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Well, he's done all that for us. We don't have to do anything. You have to accept it. And you have to walk in the light thereof. You can't reject it and walk in disharmony with it and expect to be presented unreprovable, unblameable, and holy. Oh my. The grace of God's glorious. Why? Because I can't be holy and I can't be unblameable and I can't be unreprovable in my power. But when I turn to him, and I allow him to work in me, and I pursue after him and follow after him. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee, as in a dry and thirsty land. Old Roberts preached my graduation from Raymond in 1981, summer of 19, oh, actually May of 1981. And he preached hinds feet. And there's a scripture in the Old Testament that talks about the, the hinds feet of the deer. What? When a deer runs, the front feet hit the ground, and when they come up, the rear feet hit in the exact same spot. Boom. He called it preaching on tracking with God. God is the front feet, we're the rear feet. God hits the ground, and, we, and when his feet come up, ours go right where he stepped before. And the next time the front feet come down, the rear feet come and hit right. Why about I was close up, wasn't it, Bill? That's what I think. Got a good look at your teeth. I hope I brushed them good. All right, praise the Lord. Powerful message. Yes, your, that's your graduation sermon, you think, praise. Old Roberts preached my graduation. That's awesome. <laughs> you know? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Tracking with God. Folks, the grace of God empowers us to track with God. Yes. To run with God. Oh, how beautiful is his grace. His grace is, listen now. Well, you're just being, no, I'm not here to condemn. If you sin, we have an advocate. We have an advocate. And he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When? We will, if, we, we, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and he's just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, isn't that just beautiful sermon of grace? You got people taking that out instead of empowering that. Man, Karen comes in and she just got ticked off, you know, at work or something, and she came in, and she thought bad thoughts about her boss or something for calling her in the middle of church. <laughs> and, and, she, and her heart condemned her because she sinned. The grace of God doesn't say, Karen, get out of my presence. The grace of God says, come to the throne of grace. And you'll be, forgiveness is yours. And now I can continue tracking with God. It, grace is beautiful. When see, when it's taught properly, it is, one, it is the most beautiful subject of the Bible. Because I and my weaknesses can never measure up to what God demands. By grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God. My faith in what he has accomplished in Jesus empowers me to live. He did the work. And I strive to track with God. But if I misstep, <laughs> praise God. His grace is there in the, in the provision of confession and redemption and forgiveness to put me right back in harmony with God. And I walk on with God just, of this, just as if I'd never sinned. I don't have to miss another step. I don't have to go over here and do penance, and I don't have to go over here and suffer, and I don't have to go over here and do all this mess. I just get right back into harmony with God. Track with God. I said, hallelujah. Glory to God. And, and in the end, as I track with him, when I miss the mark, when I, when I sin, when I, when I violate his holiness, I say, forgive me. And that final day, as I walk with him. And see, when I walk with him, when I sin, when I commit iniquity, whenever it is what I do, sin, transgress, uh, transgress the four different types of sin, 
When, when any of those things I do, when I ask him to forgive me, he, he's faithful. He is just. His justice, why? Because he paid the price for me. To forgive me of my sin, to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. He'll be able to present me holy, unblameable, and reprovable before the Father. Glory to God. That is grace at work. I said, that is true grace at work. Amen. I said, amen. Anybody, anybody get blessed by that? I'm blessed by it. I'm blessed by the fact that if I mess up, if I sin, and I say, Father, forgive me, I, I sin. Okay, son. Your advocates already argued your case. You're brought back in the reconciled, you're, you're reconciled back into harmony with me. And I ain't even triumphantly. He's coming for a glorious church, church not having spot or wrinkle. Now think about that. Some of the stuff people are teaching today, putting spots and wrinkles everywhere. One preacher said today on, on, on social media, he said, if we keep progress, if we progress much further, we're going to run off the cliff and crash. The church becoming progressive, open-minded, accepting all kinds of stuff. You know what Jesus said? Do you remember what Jesus said? He said, wide is the gate that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to everlasting life. You're narrow-minded. So was Jesus. As a matter of fact, he coined it. He said it was. I want people to understand grace in the true biblical context, not in some of this Looney Tune mess. Why? Because your life is better off for it. You have, a, you have a more fulfilling life living pleasing the Father. You have a more fulfilling life living in holiness. Well, I can't fornicate. Uh, duh. I can't do whatever I want to do. Duh. You're bought with a price. You're, actually, I think the scripture says you're not your own for you're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are his. Which are God's are his. But the wonderful thing is when we tell you that, his grace empowers you. Woo, glory to God. I can glorify God in ways I couldn't before because his grace is working in me. And as I track with my God, I'm the hinds feet and hitting that place and tracking with God. Hallelujah. Y'all get blessed? We trust that you were blessed by the word of God and the flow of the spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address P.O. Box 7752 Greensboro, North Carolina 27417 If you would like to contribute to our ministry please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button Thank you and may God richly bless you for your giving